Good afternoon and welcome to the Serious Security Seminar from Purdue University. Our speaker today is Greg Stevens from the MITRE Corporation. His talk today is entitled Proactive Detection of Malicious Insiders Through Information Use Patterns. Greg. Well, so thank you for inviting me out here. Uh, I'm actually going to try to talk to you about uh, two bits of research uh, that uh, MITRE has done through our internal research and development program and uh, in conjunction, in collaboration with the Institute for Information Infrastructure Protection, um, both involving uh, detecting or better understanding the insider threat. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, insider threat's an overloaded term. Many people mean, can think, mean different things when they say it. Uh, they can mean insiders hacking, those kinds of things. Uh, one particular type of insider that we're particularly worried about are people who don't need to hack. They already have all the privileges they need on their network. They're trusted insiders who are using their legitimate privileges for illegitimate purposes. Um, and they're kind of problematic because if you think about it, uh, uh, you know, they, the access controls, you know, really don't stop them. They're already inside the, 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 per, the circle of trust, if you will, uh, that, rep, that access controls represent. Uh, and furthermore, you have traditional cyber detection methods, things like uh, log auditing um, and intrusion detection. But if you think about them, those kinds of activities are looking for attempted or successful rule-breaking behavior. These people don't need to break rules. They just use their privileges to gather what they need. Um, <clears throat> There's also another type of tool, I call them focus observation tools, some in, people call them, uh, there's things called network forensics analysis tools, uh, data loss prevention tools, um, and those things can be turned up to monitor everything the user does uh, in terms of how they interact with information, however, they, they really produce so much information that if you're in a large organization, you really uh, cannot uh, effectively use them except for in a forensic, you know, once you figure out you've already been had, you've lost data from a, a malicious insider, uh, to go back through and figure out how bad was it. Um, so if you think about it, you know, you're, when, you're, when you're trying to monitor from an enterprise perspective, you may be monitoring thousands or tens of thousands or even more users. So what we really wanted to build was something that could uh, address things on those scales um, uh, in, in, with a man manageable uh, level of effort for an average organization. <clears throat> so one of the, the, a couple key aspects to what we did in terms of detection, uh, we felt that, you know, certainly you can potentially catch the malicious insider when they try to, you know, exfiltrate or take the data outside the organization. Uh, but that's kind of the last step in their, you know, in their plan. Once they've done that, they've accomplished their goal pretty much. Uh, much preferable to that would be to try to catch them when they actually have to gather the information that they ultimately want to take with them. Uh, so we believe that's actually a point of vulnerability because they have to get at that information first, and that happens over a, a period of time. And, and another thing that can help us in this approach is focusing uh, so focusing, if we're worried about the information being stolen, focus on how users are interacting with the information. How do they browse? How do they search? What do they download? What do they print? These are all things that can uh, help you uh, at least pick up the signal of what's going on and help you, so you begin to spot what's interesting. However, when you look at how people use information, the vast majority of the, of the uh, behavior is going to be benign. Uh, so to try to differentiate the potentially malicious from benign, uh, we leverage what we think of as the home field advantage. We know things about our insiders, the people uh, in, in our organizations, and we know things about the data that they interact with. When you take the context and superimpose it upon the information use behavior, our, we believe you can spot patterns of misuse. So to test these concepts, we built a system that we called ELICIT. It stands for Exploit Latent Information to Counter Insider Threats. And what I'm going to do is just give you a quick overview of the system itself and this slide, and then we'll talk through the different pieces. But the way the system processes data is shown on the bottom. You know, you go from packets to events to alerts to threats. 
uh, when you analyze the data, you go the exact, when an analyst looks at it, they go the exact opposite. So let's uh, actually, I'll describe it from left to right uh, in this and subsequent slides, um, and then we'll talk about how we actually tested this idea uh, and the results. Uh, so we, we did uh, build a network sensor that looked at how uh, people use information. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, we also collected context about uh, people and the information that they interact with. Uh, by combining those two forms of uh, data together, we built a number of detectors. Um, and these detectors, when reporting thresholds are exceeded, and we, they calculate a, sco uh, a, det a score each day um, for every user that has activity, uh, they produce alerts. Uh, now, if you kind of left things w at that point, you would still, uh, if you're monitoring a large enterprise, you certainly have too many events to look at everything. And even with the alerts, you have too many alerts to look through every alert. It's, I don't know if any of you have ever looked at an output of Snort or something like that for a large network, but there's a lot of data flying at you, and it's no different in this context. Uh, you really need, an analyst to effectively make use of this really needs an ability to prioritize what they did. Uh, and to do that, we use the Bayesian inference network and to basically, based on degrees of belief, to, uh, uh, to produce a probability between 0 and 1 that, the, uh, uh, that you have a malicious insider given the behavior or the alerts that you have seen. Ultimately, that gets fed into a user interface, and when an anal analyst analyzes it, they work from threats down to alerts that produce the threat score, score down to events that produce the alerts. So let's go into some of this now. Uh, in terms of, uh, for the network sensor, uh, we actually, uh, you know, we, for the research, we captured files on a real network. We actually used MITRE's intranet. We wanted to use a real world environment. Uh, that's been a real problem in general in intrusion detection is coming up with realistic data sets. Um, so we wanted to uh, at least have some uh, background data that was real in nature um, and of a large enough scale to we could tell whether our approach had any uh, ability to kind of reduce that signal to noise ratio. So we built uh, some protocol decoders that basically uh, used at the time Ethereal, now Wireshark, to dissect and filter frames that, that, that we cared about. Uh, and then we, on top of that, had added some second stage processing that uh, was based on some object-oriented Perl modules that we had written. But basically, you take the events uh, between client and server, say, for pro protocols tied to information use, things like HTTP, FTP, SMTP, and a Microsoft Windows Server message block, which is what they, you know, Microsoft does printing, file sharing, remote pre procedure calls, all sorts of interesting things. But the information use that happens over these protocols are things that we care about. And we abstract out the bits and bytes and get to what are people using with the information. Uh, so we also, when we see signs of who the user is, because to really apply context about who users are, we can't use client IP addresses we have to use user IDs. So when we see a, a user authenticate via one of the protocols, uh, we actually tie their user ID to that session, uh, and then we follow, you know, and we attribute the events in that session to that user ID. And with web, basically you look for a successful authentication and then a session cookie, and then you follow the cookie. Um, we also uh, collect contextual information. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit what that is, but it's the type of stuff you would see in an employee directory, things that tell you thing, various types of things about the user periodically. Uh, and what we do next is we uh, basically find things in that context that uniquely ties to that user, and we build a lookup table that where you have the key is the uniquely identifiable piece of information. The value would be a pseudonym uh, for that user. And Basically, we would take the, net, the information use behavior and anonymize it. This we were required to do just as part of the research and getting the IRB approval uh, to do this work. Uh, after anonymization, uh, we only had about 15% of the events were tied to users. This was not nearly enough to be able to begin to see who's doing what. So we had to have a way of uh, attributing additional events to the user. So we basically developed a technique uh, uh, actually two techniques that basically based on for the same client IP and events occurring before and after 
uh, that uh, 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 the event in question uh, for that client IP address, uh, we're able to infer who the user was, and we end up being able to attribute about 85% of the uh, events uh, as a result of that. Uh, the final thing we did before we had a, a data set ready for doing some analysis on uh, was what we call segmentation. A lot of times a user does something very simple in the user interface. They do a search on their share drive for uh, star.doc. Well, what happens is a series of recursive directory lookups um, in, in uh, based, you know, the number depends on how high up in the directory structure they are and how deep the structure goes. Uh, but those are all really one of event. So we create meta events to compress those many single events into uh, a, a single event. So let's talk a little bit about what events are. This table shows you uh, uh, what we're talking about. The, the column starting from the second on out to the end there below the actions row lists the types of events that you have. Things that you would think about that you would do with a file. You know, reads, writes, lists, deletes, uh, moves. Uh, we also had events related, you know, pr uh, printing when you print a file, uh, queries when you submit a, a search engine query, and then send is sending an email. Uh, the purpose for capturing uh, email, who people send email to, was to establish people's social network. What we could found we could do is we could tie information to people and then if we knew who were who was in someone's social network we could look for people browsing outside their social network as a possible uh, behavior of interest so we collected a lot of data as i said we did it at mitre uh, and we ended up collecting a, a very large data set uh, raw data wise it was about 16 terabytes um, packet wise about 100 billion uh, after filtering you know it that was reduced substantially um, and after basically attribution uh, and uh, filtering anonymization, we ended up with about uh, 64 million events, uh, and that's for about 4,000 users uh, on our, and this is behavior on our internal network only. Uh, and this spanned a period of 284 days. Now, of course, one of the challenges here is we don't know ground truth. Was there truly bad people in there? Well, we, we don't know. Um, uh, so, but we consider this background data for purposes of uh, doing some testing. So what we needed to, was to be able to generate some po known positives to at least uh, put, uh, to, to, to use with this uh, data. And we'll talk about that in testing in just a second. In terms of context, I just wanted to throw this slide up. This is what I mean by context. It's information about where users are physically located, uh, their job title or role, organizational membership. Uh, perhaps projects they work on. Uh, we also found that uh, you know the, uh, uh, the in information metadata can be helpful. We're not talking about document summarization or things like that, but um, sometimes the just simply the path to a file in a shared drive tells you a lot about what organization probably owns that. Uh, that in fact, the directory structure looks a lot like org charts. Oftentimes, uh, and you can use that kind of data. We also do, did profile user behavior. Uh, we had a number of anomaly detectors that were based on profiling the user's uh, behavior over varying time scales. Uh, we not only used the user's individual past behavior, in some cases we used peer comparisons, although we found that a little difficult. In some cases you had to be judicious in that. Uh, and we also based uh, their behavior upon comparing to the overall organization's behavior over a period of time. Uh, and then finally, the context, some of the easy stuff is organizational norms. It's some low-hanging fruit in terms of things that you can look for. Every organization has things that are not specified in policy, but people generally know you shouldn't probably do it. There's probably certain search terms at every company that you probably shouldn't enter in. Uh, there's, uh, or, or maybe there's an expectation that people will work during core hours and people will not come in in the middle of the night to do interesting things. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about going from the events to the alerts. Uh, we, we built 76 different detectors, and these were all based on hypotheses uh, where from uh, reviewing uh, uh, past case studies. Um, every time there's an insider threat case and there's a legal case brought forth, there is a charging document or indictment. It doesn't go into great detail in terms of what the user did, but it generally gives you enough idea to begin to understand what they must have done to, to, to do what they did. 
Uh, we supplemented that with the, the advice of some domain experts who had been working in this area within MITRE. Uh, and we also informed ourselves with the events that we actually, saw, the data that we saw in the database. A lot of times we would hypothesize things that we simply found a lot of people did. There was a, a benign common explanation for that we had to dismiss. Um, Again, these, detec these detectors uh, combine activity and context. There's uh, three examples there that look for different types of things that we look for. The first one is an example of uh, just violation, violation of organizational norms, so maybe terms that you shouldn't be searching on. Excessive printing is an example of where we're using, uh, in this case, uh, the uh, uh, we're using, I believe, a folded normal d estimator to kind of uh, look for low probability occurrences uh, in terms of their uh, printing behavior based on their past. Uh, and this is a volumetric anomaly, another type of indicator that we looked for. And finally, uh, non-local printing. Most people print the printers nearby them. They don't want to walk too far to get to the document. Uh, malicious insiders, if they have coworkers that notice what they print, might not want to print to the something that they shouldn't be printing at a d printer close by. Why not the printer down the hall, the next floor up? You know, they made a mistake. It's easily explained, uh, but uh, yet uh, they, it helps them achieve their goal. And there's a lot of permutations to all those different types of things. For all these detectors, we had subject matter experts that basically helped establish the, 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 uh, the settings. Um, um, for the, the for the detectors uh, and the BaseNet settings as well, um, the BaseNet itself, it, we, we we experimented around with a lot of different structures uh, and ultimately se settled on a fairly simple structure. At the root node, you have the probability that they're a malicious insider. Um, uh, Beneath that, uh, you have what we call the behavioral layer. And really, these are things where you're thinking about what's the probability they will engage in behavior one, two, three, et cetera, given that they're malicious. Or what's the behavior probability that they engage in it, given that they're not malicious. To populate these conditional probabilities, we, uh, we basically uh, gathered groups of subject matter experts and elicited from them probabilities um, uh, to try to get an idea of uh, and sometimes it was quite time consuming and challenging, but um, they ended up doing a lot better than they thought they would do. Uh, and then finally you have the, the detector layer and what's the probability of a detector alerting given that the behavior occurred. And this was done with a combination of assumptions in terms of detection um, and uh, some empirical measurements uh, in terms of false alarm rate. Uh, the uh, you know, was there some overlap in terms of how we built, you know, was there strict independence in terms of, you know, Bayes networks, you know, the theory you should have the independence between, uh, uh, you know, uh, the nodes. Uh, no, there was uh, some dependence, but, uh, it, it, you know, uh, we, we, we found, uh, we also know that, th that Bayes networks can be somewhat tolerant of, of, of uh, that uh, assumption uh, being fudged a little. Uh, so what you get out of the Bayes network, you e introduce evidence in the form of alerts for each of the detectors, either a one, either a binary, one or zero. Uh, what you get out is a uh, threat score between zero and one. And what you get is a folded normal, highly skewed distribution that's shown in the graph on, on the upper right on, that gr on the, the graph, view graph. Uh, and what you see there are the threat scores sor sorted from high to low for all the users in the environment monitor, which is about 1,500 users for a day. If you're an analyst, you're very happy now because you, have, you see few people with high threat scores and most people get little to no threat scores. So at least now you have some sense of triage or how to prioritize what you look at. And of course, this is only valid and good if, you know, when you actually have bad people, they show up near the top. Uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how we tested. Um, as I mentioned, well, as I said, there, we don't know ground truth of the background data. So we did make the assumption that the background data had no malicious activity in it. Um, and we basically had a separate team uh, develop a set of uh, scenarios to have red teams run over the period of time during our data collection. Uh, they basically looked at uh, open source material on known insider threat cases and then adapted them to our network. 
what, what would that scenario mean at MITRE? The, uh, so th we had a number of different folks, a varying seniority at, at, at MITRE, uh, execute the scenarios uh, using their own accounts. Their data was processed along with the background data. We didn't splice it in or introduce any artifacts into the data set by uh, trying to uh, put stuff in and take stuff out like that. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, and the other thing I'd mention is that these, these, these scenarios were not tightly scripted, you know, first do A, then do B. It was more, they, the, the uh, red team members were more or less given an objective, a uh, general set of rules of behavior, and then told to go ahead, you know, a certain amount of time, and then told to go ahead and try to achieve their objective. Uh, during this time, uh, the, re the, the, the team developing the approach, the illicit approach, had no knowledge of who was going to do the uh, scenarios, when they were going to do it, nor what they were going to do. Uh, in terms of results, um, we uh, basically illicit, again, scores things from zero to one. We set, just for initial detection measurement, uh, the decision threshold at 0.5. Uh, the, uh, and basically there were 19 user days of malicious, known bad malicious behavior associated with the, with the red teams. And of those, we detected uh, them uh, above 0.5 on 16 of those days. Um, during that same time, we had about an average of 1,500 users active and about 23 were also above that 0.5 level. So from there, we were able to get a, a false uh, alarm rate. The table on the right simply shows for each user that they occurred over a number of days, anywhere from one to five days. The far left column tells you the scenario, and then you have the, the, each day of the activity. These days were not consecutive. There were gaps in between the days, but we just marked them as day one, day two, et cetera. The next column over gives, tells you what their actual threat score was, and then you had the threat rank. And for a lot of the detects, we had them at near, or near the very top of, of the list, which was very good. Uh, we were very happy with that. Um, of course, we also looked at what, why we didn't detect things, and a lot of times, uh, the either there was uh, certain days uh, the, the the red teams, certain members just didn't do much. Um, there's there's a certain threshold beneath which you're just not going to be able to uh, generate enough threat score. They didn't do enough things that you would see for you to be able to uh, say much about what they did. Uh, there was also sometimes they did things we didn't expect. Uh, this is, you know, one of the challenges is building a portfolio that's robust, that can catch them no matter what they do. Uh, that's, that's very hard to do in practice and, uh, you know, they were able to find ways. Uh, now, they didn't know how we were detecting, but they were able to do things in some cases that we just didn't expect. Um, one of the interesting things is that we looked at our uh, uh, false alarms and who, w w what was causing the false alarms, uh, and we noticed that our, uh, our non-technical admin staff, like our secretaries, office coordinator type people, overwhelmingly generated a lot of the, the, the false alarms. Does anyone care to venture a guess why? Not just one supervisor, they're kind of a funnel. You know, they have multiple people. Hey, can you prepare this information for this? Hey, can you do that? And, th and at least at our company, they get tasked by many people. Um, and so they're constantly working with information and, uh, and they're gathering information, you know, from day to day, their activities change. And, and uh, so they ended up, uh, just because of their intensive activity with information combined with gathering information from all parts of the organization, things that were atypical for them, uh, it turned out to, to generate, it, that generated a lot of uh, false alarms. Um, we feel that these uh, results are a, a good improvement over a lot of the current practice. The current practice isn't pretty. I mean, a lot of times uh, you have organizations randomly selecting users to audit their behavior. Uh, maybe slightly better would be auditing based on the volume of activity if you believe that that's a correlated to maliciousness. Uh, we found with a lot of our, uh, 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 well, we found with our behavior that, uh, the, that uh, threat scores in general, we actually cor did a correlation measurement of threat score versus the number of events for two months during which the, the, uh, uh, the 
the red teams were active and there was no there's no correlation so I'm going to talk really quick now about some additional research we did because the, the, we felt that we had some promising results with the initial work, but there were some open questions. We obviously didn't detect, dis discover all the possible things uh, malicious insiders could do. Uh, we were also interested in exploring. We had looked at things from a, a, a network perspective. We wanted to see what you could in see in addition from a host-based perspective. Um, uh, and finally, we also wanted to look at uh, uh, the human factors side of things. So what we put together was a multidisciplinary team. We had some uh, behavioral psychologists, Deanna Caputo, and then some uh, computer scientists uh, uh, form a team. And we really, what the whole idea was, look, if you have two groups of users, they're going after the same information under the same circumstances, it would there simply a different motivation, one being benign, one being malicious, would that cause them to behave in statistically meaning you know ways that are different and statistically meaningful? Uh, so that was kind of the idea there. And our main hypotheses again were again, we think we thought that malicious users would uh, gather information in similar patterns, benign users would gather information in similar patterns, and these patterns would be different. Um, you know, uh, it's a bad analogy, but it's kind of, you kind of have rats in a maze. Uh, you know, they're put in in two different parts of the maze, and I don't want to compare employees to rats, but, uh, you know, the cheese is the information. Uh, you know, do they take different pathways based on where they're put into the maze, and are they predictable paths? Um, so we, we actually kind of borrowed the design from a lot of, from the, uh, uh, what the types of things they tend to do with uh, uh, experiments in uh, psychology uh, in, in social science in general. Uh, we basically uh, uh, created a, a double-blind procedure where, uh, you know, the participants, as far as they knew, were testing some kind of heuristic-based anti-key logging software. And we had to go to elaborate depths to actually make them believe that. Um, we. This experiment involved handing them a laptop, and they had to calibrate the keylogger when they first got on. And of course, if they looked up the processes, they would see a keylogger.exe. And we did, a, and we had to do all sorts of all sorts of manner sleight of hand to convince uh, users that this was really about anti-key logging. Uh, what it was really about was testing what, uh, the differences in behavior. Uh, so basically, we had two conditions and about the same number of participants that participated. Uh, one benign, the control group, and then the malicious. As I said, everything was kept the same. Uh, the scope that they were looking for, they were looking for information on a, a topic. Basically, the topic was biosecurity. Um, and they basically didn't, their environment was the same, and they had the same amount of time, which was one week. And the only thing was different was their intent or motivation, which we manipulated using scenarios. What we had to tell them was, look, I know anti-key logging is not an exciting thing to test, so let me give you a role to play to at least make you get a little more into it. And this is an important thing because if they don't get into the role, we, this, is, this is not an effective experiment. So this was really important to, make, to take a lot of time to get this right in terms of getting them into their role. In terms of participant selection, we tried to stratify by their cumulative job experience at MITRE. So we wanted everything from the junior folks, and I think the youngest person we had was like 20. The oldest person was like 72 and had been there like 40 years at MITRE. So very broad, uh, very diverse group of people, and you know, we're trying to go for a more generalizable result. In terms of the procedure itself, uh, we basically uh, uh, you know, again, everything started with recruitment. Uh, we part of the double blind is not only not letting the participants know what the purpose is, but we had a, a proctor that also did not know what our core hypotheses and the central elements of the research was. They simply had a script that they were following, so we had to hire someone specifically for this. Um, so the proctor was in charge of recruiting, and through a variety of techniques, we were able to recruit across the organization and get people to participate in this, uh, which was difficult because you're asking for a week of someone's time. So we had to do the usual consent forms, uh, rules of behavior. You know, they couldn't hack uh, MITRE's network. Uh, you know, uh, we gave them a, a, a pre-questionnaire, which was really just for them to fill out biographical information about themselves. And again, all this data was anonymized, and we had to go through the MERB to get this approved. Uh, 
Uh, and one of the things, you know, at the very end, we gave them uh, the scenario and we told them that when we gave them the laptop that they would actually be graded. <laughs> this was a graded assignment. We would have subject matter experts in biosecurity actually evaluate how well they did. Trying, we were trying, in essence, to create a performance demand so that they would actually not only fulfill the role in terms of the scenario, but the task that was assigned them, the information that they were supposed to go after. So they basically had, uh, uh, we gave them basically 10 hours over seven days that they could uh, accomplish what they did. Now, we, one artificiality we had to introduce because we couldn't really have internal MITRE data going outside of the organization was they were to deliver anything, everything that they built onto a CD. Now, you're, if you're an insider threat person, you're saying, well, that you just eliminated anything that's exfiltration related. We understood that, but there was limits to what we could do safely and get approval for to do. Um, we, on the laptop, we did a bunch of different monitoring. We had the network monitoring from the illicit work, but we also uh, used a commercial data loss prevention, a host-based data loss prevention product called Vertisys, which basically monitors everything, how uh, people interact with information, uh, clipboard activity, uh, file manipulation local to the machine, uh, moving stuff onto removable magnetic media like USB flash drives, things like that, all that stuff that you know we never would see from the host space or from the network perspective. Uh, so they were basically given a week. Uh, at the end of that, uh, we basically they would turn in the laptop. We uh, basically had a, uh, the proctor do a uh, debriefing of them for the purpose to try to ask questions to kind of understand what the, how they, what, did they follow the role, did they do the task, uh, and furthermore, did they, uh, uh, what did they think the hypothesis of the work was. If it, one of them did guess, uh, they just happened to go to a seminar on insider threat and then they happened to guess what, get the malicious condition and they figured it out and so we had to drop them. Um, so uh, we also did a post questionnaire where we were trying to ask them increasingly dig in-depth questions to try to get them to, trying to get inside their head in terms of what they were thinking, how did they approach their, their, their task uh, in order to just get some non-cyber observable human factors uh, analysis into, into this work. Um, finally, we did have them do a personality assessment, uh, NEO, five fa four factors, I believe, FFI. Um, and, uh, we, and finally, we handed the data that they gave us on, on uh, to some subject matter experts and had two of them uh, evaluate the work. And, and, and uh, so uh, we were able to compare, uh, use that data as well. So what do we do with all, for, before we go into that, let's talk about the scenarios. Again, this is what we use to manipulate their intent. Uh, in the malicious case, you basically have a, the scenario is they, well, in both scenarios, they've fallen on hard times financially. Uh, and in this case, the user, uh, the, the insider finds, uh, goes looking externally for a new job. And boy, they find a new job, but it's contingent upon them taking information from their existing employer with them to their new employer. Not that that would ever happen. Um, and so, you know, basically how good their uh, signing bonus is is directly correlated to uh, the, the quality of the information that they hand. And the, the scenario to make it realistic is you've got a competition, a, an a acquisition, and you've got one of the vendors that, that is in that acquisition is uh, uh, one of the vendors is asking for insider information about that acquisition that we would have on that. So uh, it was a fairly realistic scenario. In the benign case, you've got the same situation in terms of participants on, been fallen fall on hard times. In this case, they've been uh, asked to participate on a high profile team and if they do a good job on this team, they're going to uh, uh, get a, probably get a promotion um, and so they're a member of the team. Uh, and we went to pretty extreme lengths. We had a number of people review what we did to perfectly balance these scenarios uh, down to the ex exact words, you know, uh, uh, so that not word count, but in terms of uh, really, we were paying particular attention to how we worded everything to make sure that it, they were as balanced as possible. <clears throat> so did this work? Um, 
So the first we, you know, before we even care about the data, did, did people get into the role? If, you know, if they didn't get into the role, the, the data really is not much of use, uh, much use. So one way we tried to measure that was uh, through this subject matter expert uh, 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 evaluation of what they collected. And the idea is, okay, well, in terms of the task, uh, did they perform the same? Um, and when we actually uh, had two people evaluate, we got good high, you know, high iterator reliability between the two, and we found no statistically significant difference between the two groups. So that's good. They performed the task the same. Now the, the next question is, well, did they get into their roles? Were they, were they being method actors or were they just doing their job? Well, in some cases we had a few people that were, you know, clearly not doing, getting into the role, which they basically had to be dropped because they just weren't following instructions of the, of the, of the study. Um, in other cases, they, um, they got into it too much. Uh, in some cases, we had people refuse to do it. They said, I, I, I can't do this in good conscience. I, I, I will feel guilty. Um, uh, other people really got into it and did it. Oh, and then other people did it and would search for things like whistleblower search terms like that. They were trying to do everything they could to how to get out of their financial situation versus actually going after the information because they didn't want to do it. Uh, so we had those kinds of things too, but uh, of the people who did actually engage in the role and complete the task, the, 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 in the post-survey we found that they were definitely, they, they were answering questions in a way that was indicating that they were definitely acting very differently from how they're used to behaving. Uh, they uh, they did lots of things to try to be secretive, you know, cl physical things, including closing doors. Unfortunately, not, those aren't cyber detectable. The admins love to put screen protectors on. Uh, all the administrative people at MITRE do that, you know, and you can't really quite see what they're doing unless you're right behind them. Uh, unfortunately, not cyber detectable. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they uh, they also gave innocuous folder names. They they they. Um, one person got so into it, they actually typed, not when they were in, in the malicious condition, that they actually typed up a, le a resignation letter and gave it to the, uh, the, the, the proctor along with the, the material that they collected. So, they, so people were clearly getting into it. Um, uh, and similarly, the people who were in the benign condition were, were, were definitely getting into, into their uh, role as well. So how do we, what were some of the differences? Well, first of all, we definitely saw statistical differences in terms of evasiveness. <clears throat> you know, the malicious people didn't want to get caught. <clears throat> we saw a big difference in terms of the number of uh, sessions they use. They tend to break up their, their, their collection into a lot more sessions during the day, perhaps just looking for windows of opportunity. Uh, the benign group condition tended to be a little more uh, continuous in terms of uh, longer periods of time, fewer, uh, fewer login sessions. Uh, we also saw an interesting phenomenon where the, uh, the malicious group would, rather than, we have an internal search appliance, a Google search appliance, and rather than click on the links based on the search, they would click on the cached results so that they didn't reach out and actually touch the owner's information directly. It would be the Google spider that would go out and do that as a way to kind of just be a little more sneaky and not actually uh, have to alert the information owner that they're accessing the information, which was kind of interesting. Uh, we also found that they tended to uh, take an indirect way of getting at the information, uh, whereas the benign people would, would tend to just do Google searches and go right to the information. These, the, the malicious group tended to look up the people in the employee locator, find out who they were, uh, who was associated with uh, things that projects that might be of interest, and then they started browsing their, their shared space. That person in MITRE, everyone has shared space that everyone can get, everyone else can get to. And they kind of went at the, to get at the information directly versus the, uh, indirectly versus the, you know, searching and then just correct, directly grabbing. Uh, data, which we thought was kind of uh, an interesting thing. We also saw kind of a, a difference in terms of quality over quantity. Um, the malicious users really was kind of, were really focused on just collecting the information. They weren't trying to synthesize or organize it, uh, whereas the uh, benign users were definitely trying to make some sense out of it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 
the, it, it was it was kind of uh, you know maybe the malicious group was looking at you know they were getting paid by the bite or something I, I I don't know but they they definitely weren't so interested you know the idea was if I collect a whole bunch of information something in here has to be a value and I don't want to spend the time or the, take the risk of really looking at this data too much uh, just get it uh, and get out. Um, and similarly, there's this uh, notion of grab and go, which we're, by that we're kind of talking about bursty behavior, looking for windows of opportunity. The malicious group tended to be very bursty, grab things really quick uh, when there's a window of opportunity, whereas the benign group would just be more steady state, kind of, yeah, you know, they open a document, look at it, try to understand it, synthesize it, maybe go to the next document. The malicious people are just taking windows of opportunity quickly gathering the information, and then maybe there would be a, a lull, and then there would be another burst over time. Um, we saw that both with what they downloaded and what they searched on. Uh, one of the interesting things that we did was we actually searched, uh, uh, we actually asked in the post-survey, uh, the participants, uh, uh, we, t we basically drew up a list of what are the typical things that companies do to countermeasures for insider threat. Uh, and, you know, uh, we basically asked the users, well, what, to what degree would, and this was one of the last questions we asked them because it's a little more revealing, uh, but to what degree do these security mechanisms, would it, would it have affected how they behaved? Um, and we did it for the, mal the mal malicious and benign group. Um, and the things that we were looking at for those of you remotely were things like, well, document headers and footers indicating proprietary material. Another one would be pop-up warnings indicating, hey, you're being monitored. Uh, awareness that there's monitoring software on your computer was yet another one. Uh, signing a confidentiality agreement. Uh, being in a public environment while using the laptop. Uh, there's a general one that we call just security policy. Awareness of there being security policy related to using uh, appropriate use of information. Signing ethics agreements was yet another one. Uh, knowledge of recent violations where people were caught in terms of insider threat was one, and then finally mandatory training. A couple things were interesting. Uh, one was the thing that everybody does across the groups was the, was rated the lowest, which was the mandatory training. Um, that's actually, this isn't a conclusive study or anything like that, but it does kind of raise the question of how effective are these things that organizations are doing? I mean, if training is not effective, you know, or do we know how effective it is? I think it's, there's a lot of unanswered questions here that further research uh, could potentially uh, elicit some interesting answers to. Uh, the things that ended up being the sig statistically d significant difference, differences were pop-up warnings indicating that you're being monitored. Uh, malicious were much more likely to say that would have affected them. Awareness of monitoring software, that kind of makes sense. And then knowledge of recent uh, information use violations. Um, so uh, all those have potential policy implications in terms of how organizations might want to uh, address the insider threat. So we learned a lot of things from this study. Um, one of the things that was really important was, uh, in a particular way, you're dealing with a human uh, uh, experiment type of uh, uh, study is, uh, you know, you get only one chance to do it right, and you don't want to find out halfway through that you, you weren't, that your protocol was flawed, and there's, uh, you, you know, people were not engaging with their roles. So we, we did do a lot of piloting of, of the design before we actually did the experiment, and we found there were some additional things that we had to do to uh, really get them into the role uh, and make sure that they understood their task. Um, and it, it, that was, that really, there was some, you know, we, we I think we we did about five or six different uh, dry runs before we actually started collecting data. Um, you know, of course, in our case, you know, the handing out of a laptop, uh, a special purpose laptop, kind of was an artificiality that, and the uh, the fact that they had to uh, deliver the information on CD introduced some artificialities. Um, the problem with the laptop was. Uh, they did their work for the experiment on one laptop, and then if they had one of the things we hypothesized is that they would interleave benign and malicious behavior. Well, they did. They did it on two different machines, only one of which we were monitoring. Um, at least anecdotally, that was the answer that we got. Um, so uh, that was uh, 
in an ideal world, you wouldn't you would have one laptop for the, to them to do everything. But from a logistical standpoint, we just couldn't do that. Uh, also, in terms of uh, uh, the data analysis, um, we really, you know, especially with host-based monitoring, we had a very difficult time in separating out what is the user's behavior versus what is the operating system doing on behalf of, or the application doing on behalf of the user. Some you know, some we, we thought, for example, one things that some of the things that users would do. Well, after they do bad stuff, if they're in a malicious condition, they'll delete their cache, they'll remove their history, they'll clear out their cookies. Well, we saw the first two. Uh, the cookies, we, um, you know, the problem was it was impossible to separate out what the browser is doing as part of its daily maintenance and upkeep. It's actually more than daily; it's constant upkeep versus uh, uh, what was a, a user-initiated delete of, of their cookies. And then you have all sorts of stuff, weird stuff with Microsoft Office. It creates temp files all the time and moves stuff around. You open up a uh, 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 PowerPoint file and all the objects in there get blown up into Windows meta files or enhanced meta files in you know, a t Windows temp directory. All that looks like file opens, file creations. And it sometimes can be very difficult to separate, out, tweeze out the human from the, the machine behavior. But we did spend a lot of time doing that. Um, the other thing is that uh, you know the host-based monitoring was really nice, but there were some gaps. Um, we uh, another thing we hypothesized would be interesting what, that malicious users might do is that they might uh, interleave their behavior, but do it not only with you know you can do it certainly. Okay, you can do it good time of good behavior, time of bad behavior, or you can do the, the behavior at the same time using different browser windows or, sim simply, or, or simply separate tabs. But unfortunately, with the host-based monitoring, you can't dif differentiate different process, you know, different windows uh, or different tabs within the same uh, browser. Uh, so we couldn't really tell whether they were doing that or not. And then other simple things like we thought searching within a web page would be kind of an interesting thing to see. You know, it's yet yeah, another way of focusing down on the information and telling us what they're really interested in trying to get at. Um, but we couldn't observe that. Um, we did feed that information back to the vendor, and uh, we believe they're, they they said they would look at trying to address those uh, uh, those feature requests. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the data loss, DLP is data loss prevention. That's the host-based monitoring uh, type of host-based monitoring product we used. Uh, we also found that uh, uh, the, out of the box, they tend to filter a lot of data simply because they can't deal with everything that happens. Uh, they don't have good analytic techniques um, for reducing down things for the analyst. Uh, so. We had to unfilter a lot of stuff that came out of the box in order to see the kinds of things that we need. Um, and finally, you know, one of the things we realized is that, you know, getting back to our central hypotheses, were people predictable in their paths? Well, the, it really came down to individual users. There were things that were statistically different between the control and the experiment group. But down to the individual, it's hard to predict. If you only look for these three things, you'll detect all the malicious people. Um, uh, in terms of the predictiveness within their group of doing certain things, we, it, we found that, it, that there's just the human factor. People just do things. Uh, they may engage in some of the malicious behaviors that you think you'll see, but they, uh, they won't predictably engage in just a subset of the ones that you think about. Uh, so we think you probably need to, this tells us is that you do need to try to cast a wider net of indicators, which is kind of what we were trying, you know, trying to do with the initial illicit work was uh, if you have a way of combining evidence and prioritizing things, you can cast a wider net of indicators in terms of things that you look at. Um, that's really it. Uh, we have a number of papers that uh, go into uh, uh, the research, uh, uh, both the uh, initial internal uh, illicit work as well as the uh, work that we did under the Inf Institute for Information Infrastructure Protection. And a summary of all this work is actually in the November edition of IEEE Security and Privacy magazine. There's an article uh, that summarizes all this work. 
uh, for more information. So, um, subject to your questions, I don't know where we are in time. Uh, well, right about at the end, we'll probably take a question. <laughs> It's okay, no pressure. <laughs> it's been a long day for me. Well, if you'd like to chat afterwards, you can do yeah, that as well. Yeah, uh, I welcome that. Uh, I, I'm, you know, we do a lot of interesting research at MITRE. If there's any interest, we're actually taking this a step further and applying it to, okay, we might detect when malicious insiders operate outside their normal behaviors. Can we now take this and use a similar approach for masquerade detection? You have someone who's now broken into your network. They don't know what normal is for the account, but you're paying pretty close attention to how people normally behave. Can you now detect, uh, I, we believe there's a window, a detection window of opportunity until they learn what normal is. So uh, we're, we're pursuing that right now. Uh, we're in the early phases. Um, but uh, I am looking for people who are interested in working that. So thank you for your time. <laughs>